All right, so I'm going to demo uh, a few places where NURBS would be helpful. Um, we're going to start by creating the basic hull of a ship using Revolve. Um, then I will make a curtain or other sort of cloth, a drapey cloth, using Loft. And then we'll use Byrail, which is a pretty powerful tool to make. Um, in this case, we'll make the, uh, uh, what's it called, like a base molding for, um, like for a room or for a wall. Uh, Byrail could be used to create a lot of kind of complex organic shapes. Um, for the folks that end up in uh, like advertising animation, sometimes you use a tool like this to create like a cell phone model or maybe like a camera body model, something that's uh, one of those kind of blobject kinds of shapes. You can get to that pretty easily here uh, and more quickly than maybe you could get to it with a polygon deformation. All right, so NURBS options are found in your surfaces menu set. So in the upper left, go to surfaces. There's also a surfaces tab here that has lots of tools. So the first thing we're going to do is going to create a curve and then we're going to use that curve to revolve a form. So I'm going to go into my top view. I'm going to go to Create. We've got several curve options, CV Curve Tool, EP Curve Tool, Bezier Curve Tool, and Pencil Curve Tool. Today we'll be mostly using CV Curve Tool, and then we will use the EP Curve Tool a bit. Um, CV just stands for Control Vertex, and these are vaguely similar to Illustrator Curves, but just different enough to be frustrating if you're used to Illustrator. Uh, so what we're going to do is go ahead and click the CV Curve tool. See so your cursor change to a crosshair. What I'm going to do is kind of zoom out a bit so I can kind of see a larger view. I'm going to create the shape of the hull of the ship around this axis in the center. So a useful shortcut here is to use, to hold down the X key, which will snap wherever you click next, it'll snap it to the grid. So since I want the center of my ship to be aligned with the center of this axis, I'm going to hold down X and then click somewhere down here near the bottom. We'll see that a, that a point forms. Then I'm going to make a sort of general curve just by clicking. We'll first see a hull appear until I get to my third click. And once I have three CVs, three hull points, we'll see Maya draw a curve. And the exact shape of this isn't super important right this second. We'll be able to reshape it. But I just want something that's, you know, vaguely ship-like. Then for my last point, I also want it to be on this axis. So I'm going to hold down X again and make sure it's snapped to that grid point. Okay, so once I've got this shape in, I can edit it. I'm going to go to my selection tool, so I just hit Q. And right now this curve is an object like any other object. I can select it by clicking on it, deselect it by clicking away. If you hover and right click, you'll notice you have different component selection options than you've had with polygons. So you have curve point, object mode, hull, edit point, and control vertex. First, let's take a look at Control Vertex. So I'm just going to hold down my right mouse button, drag to Control Vertex, and we'll see uh, purple dots where we clicked our mouse a second ago to draw this curve. You can select these and then use your transform controls as you would with anything. So I just selected them, hit W for move, and now I'm going to kind of edit my curve, get a slightly more pleasing shape. Just like with other components, you can select multiple CVs and then rotate, move, or scale those multiple ones if you decide you need to do that.
All right, I think that's going to work okay. It's going to look a little cartoony, but I'm okay with that. So now that I've got this curve, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, a tool called Revolve to basically revolve this around this axis, and the sweep of this curve will create a shape when we do that. So to do that, I'm going to right click, go into object mode, select my curve, I'm going to go to surfaces, revolve, and I want to take a look at the options. All right, there are several options here, but I think the most important ones are the axis preset and then the start and end sweep angles. So we want to revolve around this axis here, which I can tell by looking at my display is the Z axis. I'm writing C in the lower left hand, it says Z. It's going to choose Z in axis preset. If I leave this at 360, it'll rotate all the way around and it'll make a kind of blurby oval shape. I only want half of that, right? I want the, the bottom of a boat hull. So I'm going to change my end sweep angle to 180. And then I'm going to go ahead and click revolve. And you should see a shape looks kind of like a pecan or possibly a boat come up. I guess that's more of an almond. Yeah. So were you in the revolve settings? Okay. So surfaces, revolve, and the square beside of revolve. No problem. Uh, it's good you brought that up because I forgot to mention a sort of important setting. At the bottom, there is an output geometry setting. So it's defaulting to NURBS, so it's going to give me a NURBS surface here. This is a surface defined by these curves. Not, this is not a polygon surface. However, I can tell it to output polygons and then sort of choose some other settings here. Um, polygons and then quads would be a typical a group of settings there. Um, I mentioned this because it's, like I said, a typical workflow to use NURBS or curves to kind of get a shape and then change it to polygons and then do further editing using your poly tools. So if you know you're going to convert this and you don't need to do other curve stuff to it first, you can output straight to polygons if you wish. There are advantages to keeping it in NURBS at least temporarily. So one of those advantages is that We've got a pretty smooth form here, but the resolution is not terribly high, which means it's nice and easy to edit. If I right click and go to control vertex, we'll see that we have lots of CVs for this form. And I can use those to shape it. I can use those to sculpt this form pretty easily. So being able to kind of guide a pretty organic looking shape with relatively few control points is pretty advantageous early on in the modeling process. It can save you time. So you should have block in the shape that you want. And then if I were happy with that, I could go to object mode. I could leave this as nerves if I wanted, or I could go to modify, convert, NURBS to polys. Take a look at the options. Let's modify, convert NURBS to polys. I'm just clicking the option box. It's going to default to triangles. Most modeling for uh, games or film is done with quads because of the way they deform. So I would switch this to quads. 
and then you could hit apply or tessellate and you would get a nice polygon object out of that. Well, nice-ish. Right, not perfect, but not bad. You could also use Revolve in the situation where you need to make some sort of vase or other radially symmetrical object. It's pretty good for that. So if I were going to do that, I would go into my side view. I'm going to go create CV curve tool. Hold down X, put a point right on the origin. Let's say we're doing a sort of amphora shape. And then for my last point, because I want this to look like it has a like a thick solid wall, I also want this last point to be on the axis that I'm revolving around. So I would hold down X, and click on that grid point. If I needed to adjust the thickness, I could do so by going into CV mode and kind of just moving this on that axis alone. If you want sharp corners with the CV curve tool, you need to have points that are close together. If you want really sharp corners, you need three points, one on the corner and then one on either side. But you can get pretty sharp with just two, if they're positioned correctly. Keeping in mind that nothing in the real world is actually infinitely sharp, you can get pretty good results with just a couple of CVs. All right, so I'm going to adjust this. This is as if I'm looking at a sort of cross section of the thing I'm going to make. Kind of make the sides look relatively even in thickness. Okay. So now that I've made this shape, I'm going to go into object mode. Surfaces, revolve, and I'm going to look at my options. In this case, I want to revolve around the Y axis. So I'll set this to Y. And I want to make an entire base, so I'm going to go with 360 for my end sweep angle. Click Revolve, you've made a pot. Another nice feature of creating objects this way is that this curve is sort of acting like a deformer insofar as it's a history node for this object. So if I select this curves CVs, I can change the profile and then change the whole object that way. Uh, you can get there just by clicking away. You'll see the curve on the surface. And then it'll take a couple of clicks, but you can grab that curve. If you're ever having a lot of trouble selecting a curve, one way to be able to select it is to select an object and hide it. So with my main object selected, I'll hit Control H to hide it and select my curve. And then maybe I want to see that main object again, so I would hit Shift and H. Oops. Control Shift and H, sorry, to show last hidden. That's a pretty useful shortcut. You can use it to hide things while you model other stuff around them. So that's Control H to hide and then control shift H to show last hidden. With this curve selected, I'll go into CV mode and you'll see that if I move this curve, it changes the shape of the thing I revolved.
that's an ugly pot. I like that. Misbegotten is how I would describe that pot. You can see that you can end up with some sort of neat effects depending on where your CVs are, right? If they're close together, you can have a kind of lip. Um, this is not terribly different than if you were to add edge loops in a polygon model. So that is how to create a surface using a curve and the revolve tool. Questions about that? All right. So let's talk about curve creation briefly. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that object. We've created CV curves so far. Let's take a quick look at the EP curve tool. EP just stands for edit point. Uh, typically, you'll create curves in one of your orthographic views. If you create a curve in your perspective view, Maya will do its best to try to understand where you want this two-dimensional object to appear in three-dimensional space but I'm gonna warn you, it's often gonna be wrong and you're gonna end up with weird curves, so orthographics for curves. So I'm in my top view, I grabbed the EP curve tool and I'm just gonna click around a bit and kinda of see how that works. Uh, EP curve is a bit more intuitive for some people because you're actually clicking and then the curve will follow the exact space you click in. CVs often live outside the curves whereas EPs are on the curve. So a curve like this that starts in one place and ends in another is called an open curve. By default, the curves that you create will all be open. You can create something called a closed curve, which is just a shape that ends on itself. Uh, the methodology for doing this uh, is if you're using EP curves, you can hold down the is it V or C. Hold down the V key, and what this will do is it will snap your next point to a vertex. In this case, it's going to be to the edit point. So I'm holding down V, and I'm just clicking somewhere near my first point. V, yeah. Uh, this will put my beginning and end points in the same place, but by default, this doesn't close the curve. To actually close the curve, I'm going to select the object. So I'm going to hit Q to get my selection. It'll select the object automatically. I'll go to Edit Curves, Open Close Curves. And we'll see it change just slightly as it connects those two toward the end. So in order to get a closed curve, you have to go to that option. You have to go to Edit Curves, Open Close Curves. Uh, Maya will not close the curves for you just because the edit points are in the same place. Why is that important? Uh, there are operations with NURBS that need closed curves to work. Um, for example, planar. Uh, since I have a nice closed curve here, let's just go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go to Surfaces, Planar. And we'll see that I've created kind of arbitrary shape here. So I think this shows a pretty clear advantage. Uh, the situation we're using NURBS is pretty neat. Right, getting this equivalent shape with polygons, especially with something that looks like smooth edges, um, kind of annoying, right? You'd make, what, a cube and delete a bunch of faces and then add a bunch of edge loops and then sculpt for a while, right? Instead of, you know, click 10 times, close the curve and hit planar. One of these is way faster than the other. Uh, I'll do a quick render so we can kind of see what this looks like. Right, you get pretty nice curvy edges.
All right, so that's how to use edit points to create a closed curve and how to use planar to create a, a surface like this. I mentioned a second ago that you need multiple CVs to create a sharp corner. So I'll demo how it is that I create sharp corners when I need them. So I'll go back into my top view, create CV curve tool. So what I usually do is I'll use my grid snap to put CVs next to each other. So let's say I'll start um, up here, got a point. Let's say I want a sharp corner that's over here somewhere. So I'll grid snap here then one grid unit over, and then one grid unit down. And then I'll keep drawing, so I need another sharp corner there. So those corners look okay, but they're not really that sharp. However, if I go into CV mode, select a corner or a CV and then move it toward the one that I snapped to the corner. You can see that I can get quite sharp if I need to. And in a lot of ways having this little curve here is a feature rather than a bug because again nothing in the real world is actually infinitely sharp on the corners and that's one way that things get that sort of fakey, plasticky, made out of folded paper and not real materials 3D look that we've all seen before. So having a little bit of imperfection at a corner like this is a nice feature. You could do the same thing with edit points. So I'll go back into my top view, create <coughs> EP curve tool. Start over here, grid snap, grid snap, grid snap. Oh, that's a weird result. Uh, when you do this with edit points, you got to pay close attention to scale. So grid snapping one unit gets you a result that's not particularly pleasing. So if you're going to use that grid snapping technique, I would say draw with CV curves, which is generally a better habit to be into anyway. Um, as you can see, when you place edit points close to each other, you end up with these kind of um, like inflection points in your curves that are generally not what you're going for. However, there are situations where you'll want to use edit point curves. One of those will be bi rail, which we'll do momentarily. All right, questions about the basics of drawing curves with CVs. All right, let's make a curtain. So if I said to you, I need you to model uh, like a wrinkled curtain, something that's kind of bunched up together, a shower curtain, a large drape, whatever, with polys, um, I'm sure that you could do it at this point. Uh, you'd make a probably a plane, subdivide it, uh, select every other uh, edge, kind of move those, maybe subdivide it again, and get some kind of sculpted edges. Uh, it's doable, but it'll take a few minutes. Uh, with NURBS, you can get there a little bit faster. So let's go to, let's do top view again. I'm going to create a CV curve. And you can really put this or orient this in any way. It doesn't need to line up with an axis or anything. So I'm going to draw sort of the cross section of a curtain like that from above. So as if I were drawing along the hem at the bottom. So I'm going to make 
fairly large number of CV points here that are kind of bunched in around each other like that. A lot of hills and valleys. I could then edit this if I wanted to make this a bit more naturalistic. You know, look at places where the cloth might not actually bunch that way. For now, I think this is roughly acceptable. So I'm going to go into object mode, select this curve. I'll go ahead and switch back into perspective mode for the rest of this because it's a bit easier. So with this curve selected, I'll duplicate it. Same way we duplicate anything else, I'm going to use Control D. And then I will move the duplicated curve up. So this is now the top of my curtain. If I select both of these curves, so I can marquee select or shift select so they're both selected, I can go to edit curves, sorry, surfaces, loft, and let's take a look at the loft options. So the important settings here are section spans, which affects the uh, number of control verts that will be on your lofted surface after you create it, whether or not there will be any, any in the middle or whether there will only be on the end. With one section span, your CVs will follow where your original curves were. If I add more, I'll end up with CVs in the middle. In this case, I'm going to add two more section spans so I have some more controls. And then your output geometry. By default to NURBS, you could output to polys here if you wanted. So I'll set that to two and then click loft. And you end up with a sort of curtain looking thing. Nice and wrinkled. Uh, you'll notice that these surfaces have one black side and one gray side. Uh, this has to do with surface normals. This is a, it's a one sided thing. Um, and that's the way the viewport will show you the direction that normals are facing. Normals generally face out for objects. That's how we know what the outside of a surface is versus the inside. Um, there are a couple ways to deal with that. If you needed this to be both sides, you could set two-sided geometry. Um, I'll show you where to do that. Hit Control A to load the attribute editor, or you can just click the attribute editor over here with that selected. So it's different than the channel box, right? I would go into hmm. I thought that was in render stats. Oh. Interesting. Okay. So double sided is checked by default in render stats. Um, I think this might just be a display issue with the viewport. So if it's important for me to not have this display black, because it's kind of obnoxious, um, you can go to renderer, legacy high quality viewport, and it'll stop doing that. So this is okay, but if I were actually modeling a curtain, assuming that I could see the top of it, you know, if I frame my camera here, this is fine, it doesn't really matter. But if I could see the top of this curtain, the top of it probably wouldn't look like that. It would look a bit different. We know that our curves remain live, so they continue to the effect the construction of this surface that we've lofted. If we take a look at our CVs. All right, I'm going to get that curve selected. Weird. Uh, so for me, my CVs weren't showing up with the high quality viewport, the legacy high quality viewport, which is disturbing error. So I went back to viewport 2.0 if you guys are having that problem. I 
I'm beginning to feel like they should have titled this viewport 0.2, given the number of bugs that are in it. That's a hilarious computer joke. All right. Um, so we can move this right. We can see that the surface changes, the surface construction. So I could go through and just kind of manually kind of move these in uh, to make this more straight at the top as a, the way a curtain would be. I could also rebuild this curve, which is a really nice feature of NURBS. So I'll select that curve. And usually this is just a matter of kind of clicking around. If you click right on the curve, it'll select only the curve and not the surface underneath. So I'm going to go to Edit Curves. Um, in this case, we could use Modify Curves to straighten this out. So I'm going to check my Straighten options. We basically have one option, which is how much straightness we want to add to this. So let's apply and see what happens. It ends up to be a bit of a mess. But I can change that parameter. Oh, if I can go over there. Let me undo that. So let's try 0.5 instead. Still messy, but less so. I could go ahead and kind of rotate this a bit. So I'm just rotating, moving, and scaling. So I could repeat that option a couple of times, right? Straighten a little more, rotate, move, and scale. Make sure it's kind of on top of things with my orthographic views. And so that way I could end up with something that's a bit more naturalistic, right? It's straighter at the top and then more wrinkled at the bottom. So let's say I want to loft two curves together that I draw separately. This was a duplicated curve. I know it has exactly the same number of CVs as the one, as the other one. Um, a lot of times a loft between those kind of curves will work, but you'll end up with some kind of odd artifacts. Um, luckily, NURBS come with a way to rebuild curves to make them uh, even with each other. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this object and kind of start that process over. I'll go back into top view, create CV curve tool. I'm just going to kind of click around and get some kind of curve here. I'll hit Q to finish the curve. You could also hit Enter. Then I'm going to go right back into my CV curve tool and draw a different curve. And the second one has a different number of CVs than the first one. Let's go ahead and loft these together and see what happens. I'm just going to give myself some vertical space. I'll kind of one on top of the other. I'll select both. Go to surfaces. And this time I'm just going to click loft and see what it gives me. It works okay. It's not great. It's not terrible. Uh, what will happen oftentimes when you loft something with two with curves with two different sets of parameters and then convert it to polys, then you end up with some odd results. In any case, there's a way we can force these curves to have the same parameters, and that's using the rebuild curve option. So I'm going to start with my bottom one. It's more complex. It has more CVs. So I'm going to select that. I'll go to Edit Curves. Rebuild Curve. It's about halfway down. And I'll definitely go into my options box here. So 
there are a lot of options in here. Um, for the most part, you'll keep the defaults with the exception of number of spans. There are situations where you have to use these other ones, but they get, this is pretty far down the rabbit hole of using NURBS to build surfaces. So if you're building a car out of NURBS curves, um, at some point you'll have to explore this stuff um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of an intro modeling class. So for our purposes, we'll leave this on uniform. Generally, you'll keep the ends in place. That just means the endpoints will stay where they are. They don't get changed. And then you'll adjust the number of spans. Number of spans defaults to four. If we were to apply this, we'll lose lots of detail on this curve. So I'm going to increase this number. Uh, usually nice round numbers are good, so I'm going to hit 20. And then click Rebuild. Not a whole lot will happen. We'll see the curve sort of change a bit. If we go into our CV mode, we'll see we have a bunch more CVs. I'm going to do the same thing to this top curve. So I'm selecting that in object mode. I'm going to edit curves, rebuild curve options. It remembered my setting for 20, so I'll click rebuild. Not much change at all. But if we look at our CVs, we'll see that we now have 20 on each of these curves. And if I loft them now, you'll see that that looks a bunch more even. And this will be useful when you convert later on, or even if you're just going to leave it as NURBS, having that be uh, even will help you if you need to deform it at all. So you can see here another example of a shape that is pretty trivial to accomplish using curves and a loft but would be pretty obnoxious to accomplish using a subdivided uh, plane. All right, questions about lofting stuff or how to rebuild a curve? I would advise you if you're planning on doing something like this and then converting to polys to go ahead and rebuild the curves first before you convert before you build the surface, or sorry, before you loft the surface and then convert it to polys, you'll just end up with a cleaner result. Sometimes it won't matter and it'll be fine, but it'll make your life easier uh, if you're building with curves that are of similar parameters. All right, so the last NURBS thing I want to demo today is the most complex one. We're going to create a piece of baseboard molding with NURBS using the BIREL tool. So you can think of BIREL as if you are looking at a set of train tracks and you've got um, the, the tracks on the sides. These are your rails. Now if you imagine taking a piece of, a uh, big piece of wire, let's say, and kind of bending it in a weird shape so that it touched both rails, and then you pushed it all the way down the train tracks, and wherever you pushed it, it created a surface. That's pretty much how BIREL works. A piece of wire that you bent is the profile curve, and the two rails are the rail curves. So that may make sense, or it may not, but we can demo it anyway. All right, so first we're going to create the footprint of the wall. Uh, we're going to go into our top view and use our CV mode, or our CV curve creation tool. So create CV curve tool. And I'm basically going to constrain all of these to grid points. So you can kind of start anywhere, but the idea here is that you create a sort of footprint of a room that's maybe more complicated than just a simple box. So I'll go up here to my three points to get a sort of corner that I'll edit in a minute. Maybe I'll go over here. All 
All right, this specific shape isn't hugely important, but it's good to have some kind of interior and exterior corners so that you can, you can demonstrate situations where this would be pretty useful. Uh, so now that I've got my room generally laid out, I'll go back into my CV mode. I'm going to sharpen up my corners a bit. I'm just selecting and basically using my tools to move them so that they're closer together. That gives me some okay corners. So I'm going to go into object mode. And I'll switch to my perspective view because it's a bit easier to see this. So what we've just done is lay down the kind of footprint of the room. If we imagine this is at the base of the floor. Right, if we can look at this um, lovely institutional plastic, or I think it might be vinyl, uh, baseboard molding over here. We've just created the bottom. Now I'm going to create the top border of the baseboard. So I'm going to duplicate this curve and just move it up. If I were actually doing a visualization of an interior space, I would have some sort of measurement here that I would probably put in. Um, since we're just kind of doing this as a demo, I'm just going to eyeball it and say like, yeah, it looks about right for the scale of the place I've created. All right, so these are our rail curves. The next thing I'm going to do is to create a profile curve. And then what I'll do is use BiRail to basically run that profile curve all along these rails and get myself a nice little piece of molding. So the tricky part here is that this profile curve has to have corners or edit points or ends that line up exactly with the rail curve. So this can get a little tricky because of interface issues that I feel like probably should have been solved already, but for whatever reason have not been. Uh, so what we're going to do is go to Create EP Curve Tool. And we're going to use this because we need to snap the curves together, and edit points are actually always on their curves, while control vert vert vertices usually aren't. So to get this to work, I'm going to right-click on the top rail curve, we go to edit point mode. I'll hold down the V key to snap to a point, then I'm going to left click to place my first curve point, my first edit point. Now I'm going to switch views because what I want to do is create just a line of edit points here that I can sculpt into a profile. And if I do this in perspective view, it's going to end up putting them all over the place. So that's why I'm switching to an orthographic. So I'm going to switch to, let's do side view in this case. So that's my first one. I'm just going to click a few. I'll do five. Remember, if your uh, tumbling is acting really strange, you can always hit F to kind of refocus on whatever you have selected, and that'll kind of reset where the way your camera works, and that'll make your life a little easier. So I need to place my last edit point on the same edit point at the end of this rail curve. So I'll do the same thing again. I'll right-click on the bottom rail curve, go into edit point mode, hold down V, and then left-click and that'll snap. In theory, it should snap without you having to go into edit point mode, 
but for whatever reason, having that be displayed makes the snapping work about 10,000 times better. So the process here is to go into edit point mode, hold down V, left click to snap. So that's how we get this curve to have its ends exactly on the ends of that other curve. Does that make sense or should I demo that again? Sure. All right, so I'll get rid of this curve. All right. Create EP curve tool. So that's step one. Step two is right click on the top rail curve. Go to edit point mode. Step two. Step three is to hold down the V key and then left click. What that will do is create my first edit point and it will snap it to that edit point that I just saw that's on the top rail curve. Now I need to create a bunch of edit points in between here. So I'm going to go into side mode. I'm just going to add a few. I'm going to move these around in just a second so it doesn't matter hugely where they are, but I do want them to be roughly lined up, so that's why I'm doing it from side view mode. So I added four or five, something like that. I'll go back into perspective mode. And then redo the same process for the bottom rail. So right click, go to edit point mode, hold down my V key, and then left click to place my last curve point. Okay, so now that I've got this profile curve, I want to sculpt it into something that looks like molding. If we go into images, we can sort of see the type of thing I'm talking about. Um, it's the ceiling, it's crown molding. It's down here, it's called the baseboard or base molding. Um, crown molding is usually fancier. It has all sorts of magical angles. But sometimes people do fancy baseboard molding too. So it might look like that. So I'll go into my regular selection mode. I'm gonna go, you could use either EPs or CVs. And I just wanna kinda move these around to get some kind of interesting profile. You'll see that they've gone a little on the wonky side in terms of where they are. I'd like this profile to be basically per perfectly orthographic to this if I can get it that way. So what I'm going to do is grab all of my CVs except the endpoints. And I'm going to use my scale tool to line them up. And that's looking a bit better. For my top view. This will still work even if they're not perfectly orthographic, but conceptually it's a bit easier to see what we're doing if they are. So right, we can see this, this profile. This is like the cross section that we can see here. Right, same idea. So now what we'll do is we'll actually use the by rail tool. So I'm going to go to surfaces, by rail. In this case, I'll use by rail one. The numbers here represent the number of profile curves. So right now we have one profile curve that we're going to send all the way down this rail. I could do a second one or a third one or a fourth and fifth and sixth one if I wanted this profile curve to change over time instead of to remain constant. Most of the time you'll use one, but for really complex surfaces, you might use two or three. So I'll click the by rail one tool. It's going to give me instructions in the lower left. Right now it's saying by rail one tool, select the profile curve. So I'll click the profile curve. Now it's saying profile curve selected, select two rails curves. So I'll go ahead and select my top rail curve and then my bottom. And we'll see that make some nice baseboard molding.
as the normal's facing out obnoxiously. Let's pop back there. Because I have these, my rail curves um, are attached to this, I could go adjust them to try to get rid of some of this kind of weird angle stuff that's happening if I needed to. That's happening because I screwed up when I made that corner. I put three in a row instead of using my normal corner formation. We can see again, this is something that's totally possible to do in polys. You could kind of sculpt that profile out of uh, maybe a plane or a, a cube with a lot of um, edge loops and then you could extrude, right, turn the corner and then extrude, turn the corner and then extrude. Um, you get to the same place, it just might take a little longer. Birel is notorious for failing if your profile curve is not lined up on your rail curves. So if you're trying to build something that's complex, if this curve here, this profile curve, weren't lined up in the way that we lined it up, a lot of times Biro will just give you no results or decidedly weird results as it tries to guess how you want that lined up. So that's a tedious but kind of important step. All that business with right clicking, going into edit point mode, holding down V, that stuff. If you use Birel, you're going to want to use that. I mostly see Birel used to make um, stuff like flags and you can use it to make sort of drapey cloth too. Uh, I see it used to make um, the complex organic stuff, camera bodies, uh, the bodies of some electronics you can use Birel to make and then convert to polys. It's definitely useful for crown and base molding because extruding this and repeating a dozen times on a complicated footprint is not actually that much fun. All right. Questions about how to use the Birel tool? Okay, uh, I want to demo one poly modeling thing that I haven't covered yet that I think will be useful and sort of mention another thing. Uh, and then I will turn you guys loose for working. So the poly modeling thing I want to demo is called the Sculpt Geometry Tool. This will give you a sort of uh, organic sculpting tool in Maya. Uh, this was this tool was later expanded quite significantly to make Mudbox, um, and this is sort of like one percent of what ZBrush does. So to do this, I'm going to go back to Poly mode. Let's go to Polygons going to create a plane. My interaction, interactive creation is off, so I'll just drag and make one. I want this to be pretty dense because I'm going to do some sort of sculpting on it, so rather than 10 subdivisions in either direction, I'm going to make 50. with a pretty dense mesh that will be easier to see on. You can use Sculpt Geometry on lower resolution mesh and it actually is pretty useful for moving big parts as we'll see. Um, but it's easier to see the results here so that's, how, that's why I'll demo it this way. So with this selected, this object selected, I'm going to go into Mesh Tools, Sculpt Geometry Tool. I'm definitely going to load the Options box here. It's going to load in the left. And we'll see immediately when we hover over this object, we have a paintbrush and then a circle. And if you click, you'll start to see your geometry deform. By default, that's not a particularly pleasing deformation. It's really extreme, and it ends at a flat bottom. Is, so with the object selected, go to Edit, sorry, Mesh Tools, Sculpt Geometry Tool, and click the Options box. So that should load a paintbrush, which you can make all sorts of little canals. All right, so that's okay, but that's not that useful by default, but we can adjust it. 
One thing we can do is make the area that the brush is affecting bigger or smaller by holding the B key, left clicking and dragging left or right. This is the same as if you use the soft select tool. It's the same interface, make this bigger or smaller. You can also adjust opacity. By default, it's set to one, which you're almost never gonna use. Usually something around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it's more common. And now you can see that I can start to get something that's a bit more subtle. By default, it's set to push, which is that is if you're just kind of thumbing in a piece of clay. You can change this to pull. If you want to pull it back up. If you've ever used Mudbox, this will seem familiar and also disappointing. So you'll notice that if you do some sculpting operations, pretty quickly you end up with effects like this, where things are kind of wrinkled in on themselves. Right, and we end up with this weird bulge down here. This is not desirable for several reasons. One is that it will deform very poorly if this were a model that needed to be animated. It's hard to texture, because how do you UV map that piece? Um, you know, with the weird effects as these things kind of self-penetrate. So to fix that, you can use the smooth, I'm sorry, the relax tool. What that'll do is move the geometry back toward its original relationship so you can relax away those seams. So I just clicked relax, just kind of clicked and dragged a few times to get that back. It also has a smooth tool in case you want to kind of reduce the effect of the things you've sculpted, bring them back to their original topology. So a fairly common workflow. It's very hard to hit exactly the mark you want when you're sculpting stuff. This is true in Mudbox and ZBrush too. So it's a pretty common workflow to kind of block in a, a pretty defined sculpt and then smooth back. Kind of pull that back toward where, you, where you'd like it to actually end up. I think you can see that you can get some sort of interesting organic shapes with a high resolution mesh. You know, I could make hills this way if I wanted. Um, you can also use this tool to move large portions of a low poly or a low resolution mesh at one time, which is pretty useful. I'll create a new plane. So we go create polygon primitives plane. I'll leave this at 10 by 10. I'll go to Edit Mesh. Sorry, Mesh Tools. Sculpt Geometry Tool Options. I have a nice big brush. Push. Kind of push down this corner all at one time. Maybe pull this one up. So just because something is low resolution doesn't mean you can't sculpt it. It just means that you're kind of doing it for different reasons, right? You can think of this as the big block end part of the sculpt. Or if you have something like, a, this is pretty useful for pieces of fruit, for example, right? Maybe you use a, a NURBS curve and then revolve yourself a pear, right? You end up with a nice pear, but it's perfectly radially symmetrical. Pears are not actually radially symmetrical in the real world. So you convert it to polys, grab your sculpt geometry tool, make your brush nice and big, and then make it uneven give it some asymmetry. You can do the same thing with faces if you're doing characters, it's pretty useful. If you have a nice high resolution face, you can actually sculpt in some detail this way. Um, although it's more typical to do that in mud, brush, mud box or ZBrush, and then use a combination of displacement maps and normal maps to get that fine detail. Uh, but you could, you know, give your character a Sly Stallone nose if you wanted, or grabbing a nice big brush, kind of scooting all those over in one direction or another. Make the left arm bigger than the right if you want, stuff like that. So that's the Sculpt Geometry tool. Um, I expect this will be useful too in Project 2. For those of you that have organic models, this is a nice way to 
um, kind of smooth things out if you end up doing a lot of vert jockeying, which will happen. Um, so if I've gone through and moved a bunch of these things around, and I don't like how jaggy that's making that look, I can go into object mode, mesh tools, sculpt geometry, grab my smooth brush, and then smooth that back out. So I don't have to go back and try to move my verts in the opposite direction to get a smooth surface. I can just use this to get something that's nice and smooth. So that should save some time. So the big shortcuts here are B, click and drag for brush size, and then adjust opacity. Questions about sculpt geometry? All right, fantastic. Uh, the rest of today is work time.